All right, welcome back, everybody. We're on lecture seven, and we are talking about sound, the forgotten aspect of film, but by goodness, one of, if not, I say that with everything, I say it's one of the most important. Um, it's all the elements of filmmaking are like a family. It's a big, happy family of siblings. Each sibling is important. Each sibling is unique. Together they form a family. So every time I I talk about Neri, it's like talking about a member of, of the family. And it's it's important. Now, I will say sound is greatly overlooked in in the film world. It's we don't often think about it. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why, but it is huge. It's it's the it's the sixth man, it's the unsung hero of film, and it all has to do um, with the fact we're an audio-visual um, species. Our, you know, we've been uh, evolved in, in such a way to have both sight and sound, and they work in, in harmony. And when one is not as good, the other generally kind of can help. Uh, make life easier. People who start to lose their sight, the hearing improves. People who start to lose their hearing, the vision can sometimes improve. Um, but there's a harmony in film between the the sound and the visual. And we have, kind of like the production designer, we have a sound designer. Now, they usually come in more after. Um, they're kind of in charge of the sound from beginning to end, but really it comes down to the mixing of all the elements to together, um, both realistic and sometimes synthetic sound, um, to create the sound environment and to create meaning of the images that we're seeing in a dynamic way. And uh, most films are going to have a lot of tracks. So what is a track? Well, this this image right here is um, of an edit that's going on. And if you kind of look from, it's got V and it's got an A here. So video and audio, we can see all the video tracks here. So this is all the video that's shot. This is all the audio from here down. All these tiny little cuts are, it's something new going on. Um, different layers of things going on at a given moment. So it is a it is a giant recipe of this ingredient and that ingredient and this ingredient and that ingredient that comes together to form a complete film. My dog is wandering around in the background for some reason. She knows when I'm I'm recording and decides to uh, either bark in her dream or get up and get a drink. So there you go. Sissy made an appearance here. Um, all right, so on the film set, when, when things are being captured, you have uh, a sound recorder or a mixer, and you have um, a lot of times a boom operator. So, uh, now, some films, they'll just, they won't necessarily use a boom, but pretty typical. Um, so the boom is this microphone over here that you've probably seen or heard of, and this is a way of getting the audio of what's going on without interfering with the scene and uh, kind of being up out of the shot so things can be recorded. Um, it's very awkward as someone who used to act. It's kind of weird having this person standing relatively close to you, like dangling this piece of film equipment above you. But, um, you know, if you're a decent actor, you can you can look past it. But you have a boom operator and then you have a mixer. So Sound is recorded separately. Um, not all the time is it plugged directly into the camera. It's being um, it's being recorded separately, and that's for many reasons. But one of the main is that the equipment where you can mix, you can bring in multi channels. So if you have your actors have little um, lapel or lavalier microphones on, um, you can run those channels in as well. So somebody can be kind of balancing everything going on um, at once. The other reason is most cameras, the um, the technology inside of the camera doesn't always capture the best. The, the recording device in the camera for capturing audio is not always uh, the best. 
So you want a good recorder that's going to capture good, good clean uh, audio. You do, however, a lot of times capture audio with the camera, and that just creates a what's known as a scratch track, neither here nor there, but that's your kind of reference point um, later on. So again, when you're when you're out recording, you can kind of see this is um, a you know just a run of the mill typical camera that you see now, and this is a kind of uh, typical looking recorder for the audio. So later on in the post production, you you sync up the sound information with the video information from one you know from the camera to the audio. Um, that's why you see the slate at the beginning of, of film is that's just the way of helping to sync up the audio with the video. All in all, you are trying to get good, clean audio when you're filming um, and just achieving that in whatever way possible is is kind of the, the goal. Just to give you kind of an overview of some of the different microphones that are out there, the handheld um, which you don't really see anymore, news reporters, things like that. A lavalier, sometimes just called a lav, or lapel mic, just something that um, can be hidden on an actor. And then you have over here called the shotgun mic, which is attached to the boom arm. Um, and all of these can be wireless or wired. More often than not, there's a wireless component uh, to them. Uh, microphones are just like people. They vary in all sorts of ways. In, you, you don't need to know the mechanics of any of these, but just to kind of show you, uh, microphones can be very uh, directional. So it's picking up a pattern almost directly you know, in front. The microphone can sort of be omnidirectional where it's getting sound from everywhere, or it can kind of be a little bit of both. Um, so the boom mic... Um, you know, it's, it's one of the pros it's targeted in that you can kind of get to the area, but it often can pick up some unnecessary, uh, ambience. Um, you avoid things like shirt noise that a lavalier, if it's clipped to an actor or something, a lot of times when they move around, you get that kind of clothing noise. That sounded like a wiki wiki, like I was like, you know, spinning a record here, but, um, Again, just depending a lot of times, a lot of sets you'll have you'll have both going on. Um, but just to give you an idea of pros and cons for the both of them. Um, so on a smaller indie set, both the mixer um, and the recordist will work together to reduce sound issues. So if there's a, a sound designer or someone like that, you go in and you use things like sound blankets to remove echo. Um, and you start to identify any problems in a location that you might have that can really cause a headache. Even something as simple as a refrigerator or air conditioner that you might not have complete um, control of, um, they could just ruin your life on a set, no matter how much you plan. Sometimes if you don't have control of that air conditioner, um, you're shooting at a um, some location where you just can't turn it on or turn it off and you're in the middle of a scene all of a sudden and it just ruins everything um so types of sound we have diegetic non-diegetic diegetic means it's sound that's happening in that world so um let's just say um there's music going on, okay, in, in a scene. Is it coming from a radio that the character is interacting with, or is it um, music that is ethereal, that isn't actually existing in that world? So diegetic in the world, non-diegetic, it's not in that world. Um, there's music, so it can be a composed score or just music added to a scene. Um, character dialogue, voiceover, narration ADR, which is, um, I've heard it both ways, it's uh, additional dialogue replacement or automated dialogue replacement. You wanna record things like 
for the background that can be room tone or ambience. So um, maybe there is an air conditioner going on. We've had to do this before where you just get clean 30 seconds to a minute recorded uh, in the room of that air conditioner going off. So that way, when you go back to post, you kind of lay that um, on a track by itself so that there's a kind of even distribution of noise within the room. Um, and then you have sound effects, which can be things like Foley or just sounds that um, are cues in the world that help drive the action of a scene. This is from uh, a shot from uh, my first feature film, uh, known as both Dorm Troopers and Roman Bickerstaff. And this is the producer. He had to sometimes fill in and do the sound. And you can see he is mixing and holding the boom with one arm. <laughs> Your arms do get tired uh, during the day holding that thing. Um, so on set, um, things that you'll be recording again, that dialogue, the sound effects, room tone, also a thing called wild lines. Um, that the, uh, again, you could see Dewey here um, is both recording and holding the boom. And sometimes they'll say, hey, this character's line, you know, some something came through, maybe a plane was flying over. Let's just get them to say their line clean so that way we have it in, in post. This is sort of interesting in that uh, the audience will forgive poor visuals, but not poor audio. I don't know why, but it's very much the truth. Like just something about bad audio will automatically take you out of a scene. Again, working with young filmmakers, sometimes they can have the most beautiful footage, the visual footage, but the audio will be have had no attention to it and it just it ruins what could otherwise be a well shot scene you can see here for this scene we had more people than um we knew what to you know, four people and um you know a very small crew and no uh lavalier mics so we just kind of positioned two booms as best we could um and recorded it that way some factors on set that ambient noise, planes, trains, automobiles, uh, controllable intermittent noise, fans, condensers, fridges, echoes, um, sometimes even like cell phones, not so much anymore, but it used to be the case, um, you know, cell phones would, would sort of interfere. Kind of like if you've ever experienced, if you've had an older phone back in the day, you'd be driving and you'd hear your phone ringing through the speakers in your car before it would actually ring. So sometimes that can be picked up um, while recording audio. Just for fun, um, this is uh, my business partner who was also the producer on my film. We used to have, we got bored in the span of a couple weeks and we started uh, a channel. We only made a few videos, um, but this is filming on location just in case you're someone who's interested in learning more about recording um, sound, you can watch this, not required. Thought I'd throw it in there for fun. And it started automatically. Okay, so modern sound um, is, I think, become more and more important as to how far it can um, impact the audience in theaters now. They'll brag about the sound system, the speakers, things like that. It's, it's very... Um, very important and because sound is becoming more complex as you saw with that that photo I showed in the beginning of this lecture all the different tracks going on of sound clearly it's become a very important aspect um, to film so whether the sound is coming out of this channel that channel wherever um, but we have a very bass driven film industry loud action films, the marvels, things like that. Sound plays a huge part in the design, especially that aggressive sort of sound. Um, but it's also kind of like the hidden edit. It's it's oftentimes subliminal. So we notice it, but we're not like, I, I know Dunkirk, I went to go see that and it was the loudest movie I've ever seen in my life. So that was not subliminal. Um, that was very liminal. Um, <clears throat> we 
um, we almost we need that to kind of sometimes help envelop us in the story of what's going on and to in, intensify our involvement in the scene. So for example, this fight scene, you could come back and watch this, hopefully you can hear it. So, um, listen to that sound. I've watched a lot of boxing in my life. I've never heard a punch sound like that, but it helps to drive at that, whoosh, that all those different bone cracking kind of sounds. They don't, it's not really how that sound exists, but it helps to really drive that scene and helps to intensify it. So music is also an important, and this kind of goes for, for all sound, um, but specifically here in music, very important aspect of filmmaking. It sets the scene. It can add emotion, um, serve as background filler, uh, emphasizes uh, the climaxes and, and just the action going on, just like we just saw that music that kind of, you wouldn't put a slow piano piece kind of in with that, that driving rhythmic beat that kind of helps move it forward. Um, it can also help create continuity in that, uh, that sound going um, from one aspect of that last fight scene to the next, to the next, to the next kind of unifies everything going on. Um, it can help identify characters uh, or a situation. And we have these things called lay motifs, a recurrent theme uh, throughout a musical or literary composition you know, associated with a particular person, idea, or situation. So we hear that and we auto automatically know. This, this puts you in mind of what's going on. Awesome. All right. Let's talk about uh, these five aspects of sound. We have the sound hierarchy. Um, what's most important in a scene? Um, kind of putting, you know, we don't need the music too loud. We need to hear what's going on. Or maybe we need to hear the music more. We don't need to hear the dialogue more. Um, it's always saying what is most important, what information needs to be um, given. Sound perspective, the relationship between space and sound, what we hear and how it sounds. Um, are we aligning with a certain character's perspective? Um, I was watching a movie the other day, Carrie, and this was kind of interesting in that um, two characters were talking kind of in the foreground of a scene, and then um, we can hear them, you know, quite easily. And the phone rings. One of the characters goes to the background, answers the phone, and sort of whispers, um, let me call you back when I get rid of this person. And kind of said in a snide, condescending way. Well, logically, if we heard it, then the we're supposing that the other character, the one who's being talked about, would have heard it too. They didn't react to what was said, so it was kind of odd. Um, but that kind of shows you we build a relationship with that perspective of how uh, how sound should work for the scene and how how it would occur naturally to us. We have sound bridges, which is something that's tying um, one scene to the next. That can be part of that um, L cut, that J cut. Um, so just something kind of going. Um, even music or something, something that's starting up earlier that's bridging um, two scenes together. Uh, Off-screen sound can create a sense of space, a sense of dimension, and then sound montage, a pattern of sounds to create complex meaning and emotion. Sounds layered in um, a different way than the images. Okay, now let's look at some examples of these. Um, 
I want you to go back and watch these all kind of from the beginning, but some of them are a little bit uh, longer, and I just kind of want to cut. Listen, if I were you, so, I would walk right. This wasn't in our um, one of our films to watch, but if you want to see a good movie and you've never seen this one on the waterfront with um, uh, Marlon Brando, actually a lot of really famous people um, in it, um, but one where his acting performance was kind of big. Anyway, I don't want to give too too much away here, but this is a, a point where he's coming to tell this woman he's kind of starting to date some information about her brother. Um, and he's kind of working up the courage to go talk. To her. You can kind of see how, even though the the horn is sort of, you know, canceling out what he's saying, those reaction shots, things like that, it's also, it kind of becomes symbolic of you know, the, the her emotional state at the time, that kind of blasting, impending horror kind of feel, which is, you know, just what's going on inside her head at the moment as she's hearing things. So that hierarchy, we're hearing the, the blast of that horn, and that becomes almost in a way more important than the words being said. Her reaction shows us everything we need to know. Um, so it's an interesting way of creating this sound hierarchy. Let's um, okay, now this one does both. It gives us an interesting sound perspective and it bridges two scenes. Hey, over there. Yes, I mean you. Your attention, please. Are you ready? Come on, baby! Uh, and this is one again. Watch, watch from the beginning because there's a lot going on with sound. But we get this idea. <sighs> Characters completely isolated in their own world, and we're sharing that space with the character. Again, if you haven't seen The Graduate, please, um, please watch it. It is a film school unto itself. Um, so we're kind of aligning um, with Ben here in this scene in terms of of sound. Now it's uh, and the perspective of sound and that isolating breathing going on. Um, but let's watch here. Hello. Uh, I don't quite know how to put this. <laughs> Benjamin. Okay, so we can kind of see there um, that bridge. We're going to be going, it cuts off here. I couldn't find a longer one, but it, it transitions us into the next scene, gives you an idea of how a scene hey, over there. works. Um, this is one I'll just have you watch on your own. It's a little bit longer, but this off-screen sound, uh, again, from The Graduate, gives you that idea of claustrophobia and tightness and everything kind of surrounding the main character. Um, and this is all off-screen, and it, it it gives a completely different dimension than if you took that sound out. It gives you um, a much tighter feel. Um, you can sort of align with the anxiety um, that the character is going through. So go ahead and watch this one. It's not terribly long. Um, and then same with this one, sound montage. We have kind of a cacophony of sounds going on um, in, in different in different ways. So um, we have, again, this one's a little longer, but we have, I'll, I'll have you guys just watch this one on your own because um, it's a little hard to talk with everything going, but we have a very interesting montage of, of sounds kind of coming together to create a deeper layer of meaning um, for what's going on with the, with the character in this scene. 
but give that a watch from start to finish and just really envelop it in that sound, the meaning of the sound and the connection going on uh, in the mind of the character at the time. All right, so last I wanna talk about sound and symbol, and this will play in with your assignment for creating uh, uh, sounds for your story. I'm gonna assume most everybody has seen It's a Wonderful Life. If you haven't, again, up there on your list of ones to go watch. But anyway, earlier on in the film, uh, Jimmy Stewart is asked or asks somebody, what are the greatest sounds in the world? And, and one of them that Jimmy Stewart mentions is um, the sound of a train whistle because he's somebody who wants to go out and have all these big adventures and the train represented you know, freedom and getting away from the small town that he's in and, and going to live the life that he wants. And so... Okay, so that train that he hears in the distance is sort of his freedom leaving the station. He now knows he's stuck in this town, that he's not going anywhere. Um, so that, that hearing what once was his favorite sound now has become almost a villain. And you see him, he just chucks away all the little pamphlets he has of places he wants to go and visit. And he's now no longer able to do that. So.